So hi, I'm Laura Welch. I'm one of the third year um, pediatric residents. And I chose this topic because, as a lot of y'all know, for the last eight months, breastfeeding was my life. Um, I whined about it enough. I complained about it enough. So I felt like I needed to share with you um, how to do it. I feel like a lot of, if you've never done breastfeeding, if you've never breastfed your child, you have no idea what you're doing. Let's be honest. I had no idea when I started breastfeeding. Um, but we have a lot of moms who do breastfeed. And helping a mom learn how to latch on, I think, is really important for us. So, it's all tits and nipples. Um, so I have nothing to, uh, nothing to disclose. My objectives, I want um, us to learn about the contents of breast milk and why it's so important and to help understand the benefits of breastfeeding. Um, we're going to learn how to latch on an infant to a mother's breast. And you're going to learn to help mom through some of the common barriers to breastfeeding as well as common questions that sh she'll come to you with. Um, this is for mature audiences only. You can't do this talk without seeing a lot of breasts um, and nipples, so if this makes you uncomfortable, you should probably leave now. Um, and so I had to throw in some of my baby. So breast milk versus formula. Why do we harp on that breast milk is best? Um, I like this quote. The human milk is a biological mediator carrying a rich variety of bioactive substances intended to grow brain, construct an immune system, and facilitate a facilitative behavior. So formula has all the basics. It has you know, the minerals, the vitamins, fat, carbs, protein. Breast milk has that and so much, much more. Um, it has the antibodies, hormones, um, growth factors, enzymes. So again, it's, it's bioactive. Um, so breast milk has over 200 components. And there's still many of them. We don't know exactly what they do. But it contains the free water, macronutrients, micronutrients, and then these bioactive agents. So these are the key proteins in breast milk. I'm not going to go through every single one of them. Um, these are the two major carbohydrates in breast milk, lactose and oligosaccharides. It has tons of micronutrients, um, multiple, vi multiple vitamins. Um, it even has vitamin D but again, in low quantities and then iodine. And so these are the bioactive markers. So what are the bioactive markers? These are elements that affect biological processes. And they have an important function in um, helping grow the infant. So I'm going to go through a few of them. Um, the uh, IgA, so there's macrophages, stem cells, immunoglobulins. The most um, prominent one is IgA. It's a secretory one. This helps support the microflora of the GI tract, as well as it's protective against the um, pathogens that are in the mom's environment. And you've got cytokines and chemokines that help with inflammation and infection, hormones, calcitonin and somatostatin. Um, these are growth regulating hormones. You've got um, antimicrobial factors, growth factors. There's multiple, multiple growth factors, including like veg and neuronal growth factor, insulin like growth factor. You've got these metabolic hormones, adiponectin, leptin. Um, ghrelin, these help, they, they believe it helps regulate um, body composition, appetite, and help with obese, obesity. Um, the oligosaccharides are important. These I thought were really interesting. These act as decoy receptors to pathogens in the gut. I didn't know that until I did this talk. So I thought that was really nifty. And mucins as well. So what does all that mean? So breast milk has all these things that formula doesn't. So what does that mean for us? So it has a huge number of benefits. So there is a reduction in the risk of hospitalizations of lower respiratory tract infections, the incidence of otitis media, incidence of nonspecific GI tract infections. It reduces neck. Um, there's a reduced risk for SIDS, reduction in low-risk population for atopic disease, as well as infants who have a positive family history, reduction in celiac disease and inflammatory bowel disease. But there, everything I read about the obesity, um, there's a lot of confounding factors. So that's kind of why there's a range, 15 to 30% um, reduction. There's a reduction in type 1 diabetics, ALL, AML. It's really important for preterm infants. It lowers the risk of sepsis and um, neck. They have fewer readmissions after discharge. And, and overall, they have improved neurodevelopmental outcomes. And then there's also a benefit for mom. It's a bonding time for mom and baby. So and what I found interesting was, most of these reductions um, 
usually there's a, a time frame that mom needs to breastfeed for. It's usually three to four months. The risk for SIDS, um, you need to feed for at least two months. And a lot of these you don't have to actually exclusively feed. You can do um, formula as well as long as there's infants getting breast milk. That was interesting. I can't help myself. Okay, so now we're going to go through um, a proper latch. And it's really important for um, positioning. So positioning for breastfeeding is very, very important because you think about it. You're going to be in this position for 30 minutes, sometimes an hour, depends on your baby. Um, so it's important for moms to be comfortable and babies to be comfortable. So we're going to kind of go through this. I'm also going to show you a couple of videos. Um, and then I have a lovely volunteer who's going to come down and, and help us show you how to, how to breastfeed. So mom's positioning. So there's a couple ways you can do it. I want to reiterate, there is no one right way for mother. It's whatever makes mom comfortable. Um, there's lots of different positions. These are the most common. So she, if she's going to be sitting, she needs to be sitting supported of her back and arms. Um, she can lie down on her side, either on a couch or a bed. And then she can be lying on her back. Um, this one can be kind of semi-reclined or fully reclined. So then you've got a hand position. So I'm going to demonstrate on our lovely little breast that I borrowed from our lactation consultants. Um, there's different hand positions, as you can see here. And I'll go through some pictures as well. So this is the C-hold. This is where you take um, your hand and you're going to put your thumb and your index finger as a C around the nipple. Then there's the dancer hold. This one helps support the infant's um, mouth. So you take your thumb and your middle finger around and your index finger kind of supports the, um, the cheek. And then there's the V hold or U hold. And this is kind of where you come around as a U underneath the nipple. So it's also important how you hold infant. So I always tell moms when I'm first starting, we're going to use our little baby doll here. It's a girl because she's wearing pink. Um, you want to keep the infant, their stomach against your stomach. So it's very important that they um, are against you. You don't eat with your head turned this way. That's very uncomfortable. And you wouldn't want an infant to eat that way either. So, oops, sorry. So stomach against stomach. You want their neck aligned with their back and hips. Again, you don't, you don't turn to eat. So you want the baby to be comfortable. And you want to support them with either your arm, a pillow, or a bed. And I'll show you a picture of what, it, what I mean that they need to be aligned. So they need to be in this straight line against mom. So holds. There are several different holds. And again, no, this is, no one hold is correct. Um, it's whatever is comfortable for mom and for baby. I personally like the cross cradle hold. Um, I thought that one was the most comfortable. But we're going to go through them all. So here I'm going to show you a couple of videos. And there I have clips from each of them. A split. In the early days, you yeah, may hear that? find it more comfortable to feed your baby lying in a semi-reclined position with your body and head completely supported. Lean back a little, upright enough to be able to look into your baby's so eyes. So this is the reclined or laid back but position. But lean far enough back that your baby's whole body rests securely against you. Your chest is the special comfort zone for your baby, especially when you hold her skin to skin. This closeness helps calm your baby and stimulates her feeding instincts. She will often find her way to your nipple with your gentle support. Be patient as your baby settles. Find your nipple and attaches. Okay, so that's the laid back position. This is the cross cradle position. The next position is often called the cross cradle hold. This position helps to support your baby's body and is a good one when you are first learning to breastfeed. Hold your baby close to you, bringing her body tight to your chest with your elbow and supporting her head by placing your thumb and fingers around her neck and your open hand under her head. Your forearm 
support your baby's weight. Position her nose opposite your nipple. Her head should be free to tip back naturally as she attaches to your breast. Okay. And then this one is the cradle position. It's often called... Sorry, guys. Cradle hold. This position is a very familiar one, but it gives you less control over your young baby's head. Hold your baby on your arm with her head just below the bend in your elbow and your hand supporting her bottom. With her nose opposite your nipple, bring her straight to you as she attaches. Hugging her in tight improves the attachment. Okay, so this is the football hold. The underarm or underarm hold, hold is next. This is also a good position when first learning to breastfeed. Your thumb and fingers are around your baby's neck, supporting her head. Position your baby beside you, tucked under your arm. Then push your baby's bottom against your side. Your arm supports her weight. Her nose is opposite your nipple. Now, bring your baby to your breast with a quick arm movement. This position gives you a good view of your baby's attachment. The mother positions her baby along her side, putting a blanket or cushion under her baby can be more comfortable. Moving the baby's legs further. Okay. And the last one is going to be the side lying. Last is the side lying position. Lying on your side can help you rest. Position your baby so she's facing you with her nose level with your nipple. Pull your baby close with your hand on her back. Your baby faces your breast. Her head is free to tilt back. Your hand on her upper back pulls her in close. This is a good position just after giving birth, at night, and after a cesarean delivery. Okay. So those are the common holds. Um, these are just quick little pictures of them. The cradle hold, again, like the video said, it's in the crook of your arm, the infant is. The cross cradle, your opposite hand is holding the baby to your breast. Then you have the football hold. The problem, I like the football hold, but the problem with the football hold is you've got to have a lot of support. So you have the baby like this, and it's very easy for your hand to get tired and start falling, and with it the baby, and then with it your breast. So it can be very, very painful unless you've got a lot of like pillows or blankets underneath you. And then the sideline position, this is good for like fussy babies, babies who are easily distracted. Um, I can't tell you how many times we both fell asleep in this position. And then the laid back or straddle hold. This one I think is really good for first time moms, um, not first time moms, when their babies are first born, babies have a tendency for their head to, to go back and, and to yank off the breast. This one, gravity is your friend. They're, they can't do that because their head's like constantly down. So I think that's. So now that you know the different positions, how do you actually get the baby to latch onto your nipple? So you always, 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 always want to start with a calm baby. Um, you want to tell moms what the feeding cues are. Feeding cues are when babies put their hands to their mouth, their lips are smacking, they start rooting at the breast. Crying is not a feeding cue. When you've gotten to the point of crying, the infant's beyond pissed off, and they're not going to want to latch onto your breast. And it can be really, really frustrating. So I'm going to, at this point, show another video. How you attach your baby to the breast is important for her ability to feed effectively and for you to make enough milk for her growing needs. A look inside the baby's mouth will show why. 
when the baby takes a big mouthful of breast with the nipple pointed to the roof of the mouth, the nipple reaches a comfortable area deep in the baby's mouth. With the nipple deeper in his mouth, he is able to suckle more effectively, triggering the milk to flow. Good attachment is the key to breastfeeding success. In contrast, in a shallow attachment, the nipple is centered in the baby's mouth, which is not wide open. The nipple lands under the hard roof of the mouth. As the baby sucks, the nipple gets pinched. This is painful and may injure the nipple. The baby is also unable to suck effectively and so cannot get much milk. Okay, and this is my last one and helps her feed most easily. Bring your baby to you, holding her close, facing and touching your body. Your baby's neck should be straight with her ear, shoulder and hip in line. This will make it easier for her to swallow. Many mothers make the mistake of trying to push their nipple into their baby's mouth or trying to attach the baby when the mouth is not wide open. This is not ideal because the nipple will end up just inside, pressed against the hard roof of the mouth, which is painful and doesn't let the baby feed as well. Instead, Lightly touch your nipple to your baby's upper lip. This will make her open her mouth. Be patient. Wait for her to open her mouth very wide like a yawn. Then quickly bring her towards you so she takes a big mouthful of breast. Pulling your baby in gently from behind her shoulders as she takes the breast can deepen the attachment. In the second example, the baby's nose is opposite the nipple. He opens very wide. His lower lip stays at the base of the areola and the nipple is aimed at the top of his mouth. The baby leads with his chin. The mother's hand behind her baby's shoulders moves him straight onto the breast. He attaches deeply and drinks well. So, a couple of key points I thought were good in the video. Um, your hand position is very important with the baby. So you always, the video said shoulders, um, I learned neck. So you want to take your thumb on one side of the ear and wrap your hand around the baby's neck and hold them like that. If you wrap around the back of their head and you push them into your breast, they have a tendency to, to push back against you. You don't want that. So wrapping around their neck, holding them close to your body, like we said earlier, stomach to stomach. Um, a lot of moms will express a little breast milk on their nipple and put it underneath their nose to kind of help get them to open up wide because you, again, like the video said, you want a big, wide, open mouth so they can take the deepest latch. Um, you want to have them tilt their head back slightly because you want the chin to come forward. And um, you want to always, always, always bring the baby to breast, never the breast to baby. So I'm going to have my lovely volunteer so I can show how you can help a mom attach. <laughs> I'm the one bearded breast feeder. <laughs> okay, so I thought this is mine. It's a boppy. It's just it specifically designed to help support a mom and the baby. So you put this around. No, I don't think it's gonna fit. It, it will fit. It will fit. <laughs> okay. Uh, unhealthy diet here, George. <laughs> All right, let me get on this side. Okay, so this is your breast. Thank you. Okay, this is your baby. Okay. <laughs> so um, I always like to start with the kind of the cross cradle hold. To me, that's the most natural hold. So you hold the baby with your opposite hand and hold your breast with the hand on the same side. Um, and he's got the C hold, as you can see here. Um, so you want to make sure baby's completely turned against your chest. Again, if you, you don't eat like this. You don't want baby C like that either. Um, 
So a lot of times, and if you're uncomfortable, you're uncomfortable, but a lot of times you're going to have to touch mom's breast. Um, you always ask her, I always ask her before. Is, are you okay with me touching your breast? Understood. Okay. Yes. All right. So a lot of our patients have quite large breasts. And there is a lot of concern as to whether baby will sit around, around it. So I tell moms that they can sandwich down, like a sandwich, their nipple to make it a little smaller so baby can get a big, large bite of it. So again, you want to um, kind of tease baby with the nipple underneath the lip and the nose and to, so that she gets a big open wide, um, wide big open mouth. Um, and then when she has, as soon as she has that big mouth, you kind of, it sounds to me, shove her on. <laughs> So big, open, wide, we tease, tease, and then shove on. You also want to make sure that the nipple, like in the video said, is kind of pointed, tilted up, because you want it to go into the, the pointed up toward the soft palate. So that's another important point. And then you want to kind of tilt the head back a little bit and bring the chin forward and shove her on. That's what my lactation consultant did to me. So <laughs> um, there's a other couple of holes. You want to do the football hold. So the football hold, the baby's kind of tucked in under your arm. Um, yeah, same, same kind of hold, and then you bring the baby up. So the, again, this problem, if you don't have a lot of support underneath here, your, your arm has a tendency to fall down and with it your breath. So there's just a lot of support with that one. I won't make you do the sideline hold. How kind of you. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Um, a couple points. Most of the areola needs to be in, in the mouth. Um, so it, it's got to be a very, very large large bite that this kid has in bite, but they, they have no teeth, so it's fine. Um, do y'all have any questions right now at this point? Do I need to show again anything on how to help a mom breastfeed, how to latch on the baby? Oh, good? Okay. Thank you, Dr. Sorrell. Uh, thank you, Dr. Wilson. <laughs> <laughs> Let's lay the baby there. Okay, so now you know how to latch on the baby. So these are just a couple more pictures. You see how the nipple is pointed up. And the baby's oh, wide, wide mouth, take a large chunk out of the bum. And then this is just another video showing that how much of the nipple needs to be in the mouth. So how do you tell if it's a good latch? So the baby's on. You got the baby on the bum. So how do you know that the baby's going to be getting enough milk? So the lips need to be curled outward. The chin is typically buried into the breast. Um, you'll see the, the cheek line where the baby's sucking is like the smooth arc. It's not dimpled. They'll have rhythmic sucking, and they usually go suck, 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 pause, suck, 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 pause. And you'll be able to hear audible swallowing as well. And then when you remove the breast from the mouth, the nipple should not be flat. It should be nice and rounded. So we're going to go through a couple of pictures. So the baby on the left has this nice big open mouth, um, smooth cheek line. So this is a really, really good latch. The one on the right is not. You can see it's not very wide open. Looks like it just has a little bit of the nipple in there. And again, if, if they're just chomping down on the nipple, it's very, very painful. So again, you can see that the, on the one on the right, the mouth is not wide open. It looks like most of the areola is outside the mouth. So that's not a good latch either. Here, I don't know, it might be a little hard, but the one on the right has like this dimple, and that's not a very good latch either. And then again, your nipple, when you remove it from the baby's mouth, should be nice and rounded like the one on the, the left, not flat. Because that one means that the nipple was being chomped down on the hard palate, and that, again, it's painful. So there's a lot of barriers, I believe, to breastfeeding. Um, a lot of reasons that mom decided to switch to formula. So I chose to talk about these because I hear about these a lot in clinic, um, and these are just ways that you can help mom and support mom through her breastfeeding journey. So these are some of the issues we're going to cover. So nipple anatomy. A lot of moms I've seen in nursery, um, in clinic, they're like, I have flat nipples, or they're inverted. So what do I do? Well, first of all, they need to get help early. <laughs> they need to have the lactation consultant um, help them as soon as possible. The other thing is that a lot of times the feeding itself, the act of feeding, will help bring out that nipple. Um, so the lactation consultants told me this trick. It's called the teacup hold. So say this is mom's nipple, not this. It's flat or it's inverted, and you can't you can't get it for baby to latch on. So what you can do is you can take a teacup hold, and it's kind of like the sandwiching down. You just get this as much tissue as you can and for babies to latch on. And a lot of times the act of feeding can bring that nipple out and help them in the long run. Nipple shields are not recommended until after the milk is established, so just let the parents know that. But they can kind of press it down to, so that 
the infant can latch onto something. So painful nipples. Breastfeeding should not be painful. Um, now, will you be sore after you initially start? Absolutely. Absolutely, you'll be sore. Um, but the act itself should not be cringeworthy. You're just dying because the baby's hurting you. Um, if that is, it usually means it's a bad latch. And there's a couple of things you can do. You can have mom show you how she's latching on and try and help reposition to get the, a, a better latch. Um, a lot of times that, because in the first one to two weeks, you are super sore. Like this is something new that's happening to your breast. Um, and a lot of babies end up using you as a pacifier after they're done eating. If you're sore, you can just stop that. You can just discontinue the, the non-nutritive sucking is what we call it. Um, and then don't just like pull a baby off your breast. There's a way to break that suction that's not going to be any more painful. And you stick your finger kind of in the side of the infant's mouth, and that will break the suction and cause them to let go. So just pulling off the breast can traumatize the nipple even more. Nipple confusion. So I feel like this is, there's some debate on this. AAP recommends waiting three to four weeks before introducing a pacifier um, because they worry about nipple confusion. Now, did I wait three to four weeks for my own? No. I think I, we waited two weeks, a week and a half. A lot of babies, especially in the first couple of weeks, they do a lot of sucking that's non-nutritive, and they just they use you as a pacifier. And I was going crazy, and so I had to use a pacifier. <laughs> um, so I've read a couple different studies, and there's, there's some debate. But AAP right now recommends three to four weeks. I personally tell my mothers, you do what keeps you sane. And if introducing a pacifier at one week or two weeks makes you sane and gets you rest so you can take better of your child, I don't see the issue in that. But I also tell them what AAP recommends. Um, now, bottles. There is some concern about introducing bottles early to a breastfeeding child. So bottles are a lot easier to get milk out of than a breast. They don't have to wait for the letdown. Um, they get almost this instant gratification from the bottle. So they like it better, and they don't want to go to a breast where they have to work more. Babies are smart. Um, so what you can do is you can use slow flow nipples. Um, you can use pace feedings. This is kind of where you keep the bottle more level so they don't get as fast a flow. And then you can have them suck, 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 and stop, suck, 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 and stop like they would on a breast. So they're, they're, this is concern. My own daughter went through it, and it was very frustrating. Bowel movements. I feel like I have a lot of parents come in like, oh, she hasn't pooped or in a day, or her poop turned yellow, and what's going on? So the number of poops change. You, typically, in the first um, month of breastfeeding, they'll have a poop with, their, with every or every other feed. It's very normal. After the first month, some infants can go up to three or four days without pooping. Um, the thought is that they're just using all of the breast milk that they've taken in. So you just need to reassure parents that as long as the bowel movements are still soft, there's nothing to worry about unless there's something else concerning on exam. And then the color changes as well, so that, that needs to be a reassurance. Again, the color changes. It can go from meconium black to green and then to that seedy yellow that we're typically associated with breastfeeding infants. So my milk hasn't come in, and so they want to switch to formula. I've heard this countless times too, I'm sure. Um, you need to educate the parents that milk transitions. So they're making milk. The first milk is called colostrum. Um, you typically make it one to five days, and then you switch to the, to the more mature milk. So what they mean by their milk hasn't come in is they haven't gotten that large volume that comes in typically is between days three and five. Um, they just need reassurance that the milk they are getting is enough for the baby. So I like this image. So this shows you what the size of an infant's um, stomach is as it progresses. So day one is the size of a grape. So you shouldn't, a lot of moms see newborns getting those bottles, and that's two ounces. Really, infants shouldn't be taking that anyway. Their stomachs are just not big enough. So you have to just constantly reassure that they're getting enough, they're getting enough, um, as long as they're having wet diapers and they're starting to gain. Oh, well, not, not yet, because the first couple of days they don't gain. But you just need to, reassurance is the big thing here. And then I kind of transition into low milk supply. I have a lot of, lot of moms who come to me saying, I'm just not making enough for babies. That's why I started home formula. 
to have true low milk supply in a mom that has no risk factors, is eating enough and drinking enough, is very, very, very rare. Um, I think moms have this unrealistic expectation, like I was mentioning earlier, that of how much they should be making, how much the baby should be getting. Typically, I, formula fed babies eat a lot, I feel like eat a lot more than breastfed babies. But, um, so they, and they also, Facebook, I don't, I'm a part of this group on Facebook called Dr. Milk, and this is um, breastfeeding physicians across the US, and I see pictures of women who have a freezer full of breast milk, and I'm super jealous. So, but those aren't always the norm. Um, most moms make enough for their child, and you don't want to look at how much you pump out. Pumping is never a good um, indicator of how much you're making. The baby is way more efficient at getting out breast milk than pumps are. So you need to look at the weight gain and the number of wet diapers, typically between four and six for breastfed babies. So you just need a lot of reassurance that this is normal. You don't need to supplement with any extra um, formula. And then I thought this was a good little table of how much they should be getting in the first days, um, in the first weeks. And then one to, one to six months, your, your breast milk is typically um, established, and that's how much you're going to make. And again, three to four ounces at every feeding. How many infants do we have that are one month old and come in and they're eating six or eight ounces? So again, parents have this unrealistic expectation of how much they should be getting. Just a lot of reassurance, I feel like. So then moms get into this vicious cycle of oversupply as well. This is where moms want to, they feed their baby, and then they, after they feed their baby, they pump. And so the body is, I think, an amazing thing. It, the body knows how much the baby should be getting, and it regulates itself to make that much. Now, if you're stimulating the breast after the baby is done eating with the pump, then your body's like, oh, I've got to make more, I've got to make more, I've got to make more, because the baby needs more. So you can get into this really vicious cycle of engorgement, leaking, and it can be very, very frustrating. A lot of times, people with oversupply, they, they tend to have a stronger letdown, and baby gets on, and they start choking because it's so strong, and they can't handle it, and then they don't want to feed. So it can be this really bad thing. So remember, it's all about, it's all about supply and demand. You're going to produce as much as you need. Um, and then we recommend not pumping until about three to four weeks postpartum to help. Because again, that's the, kind of the magic. A month, your breast milk is more or less established at that point. So growth concerns. I, I feel like this is a big issue, especially in our clinic, that we forget that breastfed babies on the whole are a little leaner than formula fed babies. They don't get as much volume generally. Um, so we need to use the WHO growth curves versus the CDC. The, the WHO accounts for more um, formula, not formula, breastfed infants, whereas the CDC is more here in the US and it accounts mostly for formula fed. So it kind of is, it's skewed a little bit if you, if you look at just the CDC growth curves. Sometimes um, we have this, this magic number of two weeks. Infant needs to be gaining weight, needs to be back up to birth weight by two weeks. Sometimes they don't, um, and as long as they're gaining, you can probably stretch it out to three weeks, as long as you have good close follow-up, and as long as there's nothing else going on, and mom is feeding her um, like she's supposed to be. So I, I think this is a, a point, uh, a frustration for me, because my own infant, she was very, she kind of dipped down a little bit because she wasn't wanting to eat. And we did substitute with some formula. And I cried the entire time she drank that bottle. So it can be very frustrating for moms who really do want to, to feed, and you're telling them you're not doing good enough. Let's use formula. So just kind of be mindful of that for us who really wanted to feed. Returning to work. So this can be a huge, huge barrier for um, breastfeeding moms. Um, thankfully, back in 2010, they had the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, and that mandated that employers provide a reasonable break time for nursing mothers and private non-bathroom areas. So this was a huge, I think, step in the right direction for breastfeeding moms. Now that we, it's mandated we have to have break, break times for it and areas to be able to pump. Um, breast pumps are expensive, so now insur most insurances are paying for um, or providing breast pumps. So I thought that was really really um, awesome because I got one of mine through my insurance. Um, but this is a, is a big deal. So I, a lot of y'all may or may not know, I was on the wards in August, and that's the, when I decided to stop pumping at work. 
it became too much. It was a very stressful period of time. So just be mindful that returning to work is very stressful to, to pump at work, to get everything you need to be done, to feel like you're not slacking and you're, um, you're not carrying your weight through work. That was a big frustration of mine. I, I didn't personally feel like I was doing my part because I would go 30, 40 minutes to go pump somewhere. So I think just be mindful of that. And then another barrier is lack of partner support. If the father or their partner is not supportive of the breastfeeding, it can be a hindrance to mom. Um, so both parents need to be on board. And then dads or their partners can play a role too. So don't, don't think that dads are just doing whatever. They can help out. Um, sometimes you're stuck in a position for 30 minutes and you're like, oh gosh, I'm thirsty. I'm so thirsty. Can you bring me something to, to drink? Sometimes breastfeeding makes you ravenous, so you want food. And then if you have other children, the dads can take care of the other children and do some of the housework while they breastfeed. So both parents really need to be on board for this to work. And then stress. Breastfeeding was probably one of the most stressful periods of my life. Um, I loved it. I loved that I could provide for my daughter without having to use formula. But it's very stressful from her not wanting to eat, from pumping up at work. So I feel like there were times, especially when I was more stressed, that my supply was a little lower. And stress can cause your um, supply to worsen. So, and it worsens if mom has no support at home or work. If her job isn't letting her, is giving her a hard time about pumping, if her partner doesn't want her to pump. So just encourage her. And I think congratulate her for making it this far. It's hard. Y'all, if y'all have never done breastfeeding, if you've never breastfed your child, it's, it's one of the hardest things. So I just wanted y'all to be mindful of that. This cutie. So, parents also come to us with a lot of questions, um, and I've had several of y'all come to me with questions: is what you to do. So I just wanted to come through that. So the sleepy infant this is very common. My infant just she just falls asleep on my breast. I don't know what to do. Every time I put her on, she goes to sleep. It's very common. Aaliyah did it too. And to think about it, they're right here at mom. This is their comfort spot. This is their safe spot. This is nice and warm and cozy because it's mom. It smells like mom. I can smell her milk, it's mom, so I'm going to go to sleep. So make sure that they're not too warm. So a lot of times I would strip Leah down to nothing, just, just a diaper, um, so she wouldn't be so warm. You can do skin to skin, um, so the infant's against your skin, and that can help with some stimulation to breastfeed. A lot of times babies are just more alert at certain periods, so try and get, all your feeding, try and get a lot of your feedings in then, so cluster a bunch of feedings together then. Don't I don't like to allow shallow suckling. This is just where they're using the mom as a pacifier. Um, and you can tell the, the sucking is kind of light and fluttery, and they're, they're, you don't hear any audible swallowing. Um, you can do compressions during breastfeeding. This is where you compress your breast. You kind of massage it, and that helps get some of the milk out. So when they are alert, they get more milk. And then stimulate the baby while feeding. I rubbed Aaliyah's head. I hit her foot. I would tickle her back, and that would help wake her up as well. So the stressed or hungry infant. Um, this is where moms let the infant get past the point where they're just pissed off and they don't want to latch. Um, so you want to attempt to feed. Re remind moms to attempt to feed before they're breastfeeding. Remind them of the cues, like we said earlier, the mouth to hands, um, the rooting, the, the smacking their lips. So one of the you want to calm the infant before they latch on. So one of the the lactation consultants told me about this, and I wish I'd known about it. It's called the reboot and reposition. This is where you take baby, you put their arms down by their side, and kind of gently put them here. You don't smother them, obviously, but um, this helps calm them because, again, they're at the chest. You can do skin to skin at this time, and then sometimes just taking them to a dark, quiet room is, is helpful. They're, they're away from all the distractions, all the noise. So how often and how long should you feed? I feel like 8 to 12 times in a 24-hour period is a good number for parents to reach. You want at least eight up to 12 um, times. So how long varies from one infant to the next? So, so usually when infants are first born, they're still learning. You've got to remember that. They're, they're newborn. They're still learning how to do things. It can take a long time, so they're not as effective as removing milk. When they get older, there are some infants who can drain a breast completely in five minutes or less. Um, some still take up to 30 minutes. So it just kind of depends on the infant. So there's no right or wrong answer on how long they should feed. You feed as long as they're, they're swallowing and sucking down milk. When they get to that, again, that light, fluttery, 
pacifier. I like to call it pacifier feedings, and you probably want to discontinue. And I always tell parents or moms that the infant should drain one breast prior to moving on to the next, because you want to get that good hind milk. Um, there's two types of milk in your breast. So the foremilk is what they get initially. It's more watery, and the hind milk is where all the good fat is. So you want them to drain one breast completely. And storage of milk. So the, six, the rule of sixes, I think, is a good number to go by. So you can store milk room temperature for up to six hours. So it can be sitting on the counter for up to six hours. If you're only three or four, but it can be good up to six. Refrigerated up to six days, and then frozen in and just a regular little freezer up to six months. In a deep freeze where you're not constantly opening up the freezer, it can go up to about a year. But again, that's in a deep, deep freeze. So supplements. Um, we need to remind moms that they need to take vitamin D. They need 400 units is from birth, and they need iron from about four months of age. And then this is another common one. My baby's feeding all the time. She won't stop wanting to feed. So infants go through growth spurts, and usually during this time, they just want to eat, 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 and you're just like, baby, there's nothing left. I can't tell you how many times I told that to Leah. I was like, there's nothing left. Just let me sleep. So this, again, is reassurance. Usually um, their growth spurts go or occur about two to three weeks and about six weeks as well. Reassure that they d moms don't need to give any extra. I think day four I gave Aaliyah extra formula because I was like, she was, she's not getting full, she's not getting full, I can't keep doing this. And again, I cried the entire time she got the formula. But that's just, you know, the stressful period anyway. So just, I, I think a lot of reassurance at that age and, and kind of telling moms beforehand so they, they are, they're aware. Um, I wasn't aware of the growth spurts. <laughs> And so it was very frustrating during those two to three weeks. But I think when you first see moms and they're breastfeeding, like, just, hey, you know, at this, around this time, she's going to go through a growth spurt and, and she's going to feed constantly. So just be mindful of that. Okay, but she's cute. So these are my resources. And then I also use our lovely lactation consultants, Lynn and Julia, um, the leader best friend on nursery. They're very helpful. So do y'all have any questions? When dad asks, what do I say when my wife is distraught? What? Because I know my husband was like, it's okay, just do whatever makes you happy. And I'm like, I'm trying, but the baby <laughs> won't cooperate. Well, we can formula feed, it'll be okay. So like, exactly no, that's what not what I want to hear. <laughs> so, what do you tell the dads? How? What words can they say to be supportive? I. I think during that period, this, this is just me personally, I, I want them to say, you're, you know what, you're beautiful, you're a great mother, you're doing a great job, you know, this, this, is, gonna, this is gonna pass, you just keep on. I don't know, I, that's me personally what I wanna hear. Oh, what did I say? <laughs> what did you say that worked? I said, you're beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I, 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 I didn't, I did manage not to mention formula, but anyhow, I, that, yeah, I basically go for it. I said, honestly, I mean, just, you know, if there's anything I can do to help you or make you more comfortable, let me know. You know, if you need help from somebody, uh -huh. let me know. We'll work something out. And, and then, uh, I, think so. I think the dads need to know that mom needs more encouragement than anything. Uh -huh. Yes, yeah. you're doing this right. Everything's going fine. We have a beautiful baby. How can I help you to do this? Not just, I'll be here for whatever you decide. Are you freaking kidding me? I haven't slept in three months. I have no idea what I want to decide. <laughs> and I also think it's important to remember that feeding baby is the most important thing. So some moms can't breastfeed, some moms choose not to breastfeed. Um, the lactation consultants have this nice little three steps. So feeding baby is number one. Um, if mom really wants to breastfeed, then protecting the supply is number two. And then eventually number three is getting the baby back on. But we have to remember that feeding baby is, is most important. There's some moms who can't breastfeed for whatever reason or don't want to. There's no sense in, in shaming her like, oh, you're not, you're not a good mom for not breastfeeding, or you're not, whatever, you didn't make it up to a year. I struggled a little bit when I decided to stop, but I didn't make it to a year. Um, and husbands or spouses don't, don't be like, well, just, just pump more. I got that one. 
Don't ever say that to a woman. Just pump more. You can just pump more milk. That's not, a, that's not an okay thing either to say. <laughs> Uh, just from that too, I think one thing that was temptation for me as a dad was to jump in and, you know, when she's trying to tell me about the problems, I'm like, well, we can do it. But I, I, for me, I, I try to do is just listen to what she's trying to tell me, you know, at least have some an ear she can share frustrations with and not be jumping in constantly, you know, well, we can do it, but just listen intent, intently and, and to her issue, to the problems. Yeah. you want to fix the problem. Right. And you you don't want to wanna just listen. You want to fix the problem. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> All right. You did an excellent job, Look, yeah. That was yeah. fabulous. I'd like to add a couple of comments to some of the things. First of all, starting with the issue of I don't have enough milk. In our society, formula is everywhere and uh, has been for at least the last 60 years and really start you know became pretty pretty available back in the 1920s so we're approaching about 100 years worth of formula being readily available for moms but i i tell people a lot of times if you stop and think about it from an anthropologic standpoint where would humankind be if breast milk weren't enough those first few days when the mothers are talking about the fact that they don't have uh, sufficient milk to feed their babies. This over, over millennia, the bodies have evolved to produce what the baby needs. And as you showed very nicely in that one slide with your pictures of the fruit, you know, the baby's tummy volume is very small initially. And, and that first day of life, the baby's only getting about one to two cc's per breast per feeding, so about a teaspoon max per feeding. Um, but the tummy's small, and so it fills them up. And but the mother's body is is gradually increasing the milk volume that her body is making, so that by day three, you're up to about a 30 cc volume because the baby's gradually getting more with each feeding and so on and so on. So it, it, the, the necessity of feeding often, the, the minimum bake times in 24 hours, ideally about 10 in 24 hours is really important. It is also important, and I'll reemphasize what she said about not letting the baby suffer too long on the breast because the mother does have to sleep. If you stop and think about the fact that a breastfeeding session is probably going to take on average about 30 minutes per time, and you're doing that every couple of hours during the day, when is the mother going to sleep? And if the mother's too tired, being too tired interferes with, with milk production. And so she, her body won't make what, what, the, what the baby needs. Um, so just to kind of give you maybe a little bit more background information about that issue of, of not enough milk initially. Feed the baby often, don't let the baby use you as a pacifier, and your milk will come in. And, um, so, and it's pretty rare that you have moms whose milk doesn't come in within that three to five day period. And the, the five day period is really more for the first time moms. As, as you're working with multi graduates their milk comes in sooner. Um, the other thing is that with our population, the population that we tend to work with here, is that breastfeeding really is a, a new phenomenon for, for this population. And so they don't have a lot of support in the community. Um, and, and there's not this global gestalt of information about what goes on with breastfeeding. And, um, so, so it's important that we provide them with their information. And remember, too, that a lot of our moms are going to be going back to work, but not necessarily and, and not frequently the kinds of jobs that we have where we have the, um, um, uh, the ability to take 30 to 40 minutes to go off and pump while we're uh, at work. You know, if you've got a mom who's working you know, behind the counter at the local racetrack gas station or uh, at McDonald's or something, it's going to be, you know, there's going to be pushback on her, you know, say, I, I need to go pump. Uh, so, so be aware of that when you've got working moms, talk to them ahead of time before they go back to work 
about what kind of job they're going back to. Do they know what facilities are available to them when they go back? And um, do they have any, have they talked to their employer about this? And you know what kind of support they're going to get? Because in theory, on paper, they're supposed to be allowed to do this, but but practically speaking, that may very well be an issue. What happens with our teen moms that go back to school? Right, and that's another. I've been told they're not allowed to pump at school. That's what I've, I've spoken with a couple of the teen moms and. The schools don't have yeah, they, areas will allow them to go pump. Well, and it's not just for the teen moms, it's the teachers too. And that's a problem across the country. Teachers uh, because have mm -hmm. babies too. Mm -hmm. Right, and, and, and that's where it first became a real problem was teachers who a lot of times are having to monitor classes during lunch and uh, recess and stuff, so they don't even get that time off and stuff. So, so again, just be mindful of, of what kind of what, what the mom is going back to. And everything I read about the, the benefits, all those those wonderful benefits of breastfeeding, it doesn't necessarily mean exclusive breastfeeding. So as long as mom is getting some breast milk into them, um, whether she's just doing it in the morning at night, because after I stopped pumping, I just fed Aaliyah in the morning at night while I was home. Um, so as long as they're getting some milk in, they still get some of the benefits. So I think that was important. That's important too, that they can yeah. still get the benefits without having to kill themselves pumping at work. And, and to let moms know that, the body, that her body will adapt mm -hmm. to uh, to provide milk only at the times when she is available for breastfeeding, and then it'll cut down uh, on the milk volume that she's producing during the time that she's at work or at school or whatever and stuff. And it doesn't happen immediately, but it does happen pretty quickly. And a lot of moms aren't aware that you can you can do both if if that's what works out best for her. So. Um, and then the third point, uh, the issue about pacifiers, um, because I am not anti-pacifier either. We have some babies who come out of the womb. In fact, we've got one in the nursery right now with, suckling, with a sucking blister. And um, you know, these, these babies are, are babies who have a very strong urge for non-nutritive sucking. And, um, but the, the, the reason that the um, AAP's breastfeeding group has recommended to hold off on pacifiers is because particularly in a population that's not very savvy or educated about breastfeeding in general, there's a tendency to use pacifiers to, to, to hold off feedings. And we definitely don't want that to happen because then uh, again, the mother's body won't make the, the milk that the baby needs to grow because it is a supply and demand issue. Also, um, the pacifiers have been shown to help reduce the incidence of incidents. So there's mm -hmm. even been within the AAP, there's been some controversy about what policy to recommend when it comes to pacifiers because on the one hand, it reduces the incidence of SIDS. On the other hand, it may interfere with breastfeeding practices if it's introduced too soon. So you've got to you know, play that by ear and be, and be careful about what you're telling your moms. But at the same time, I, I I agree, I'm, I'm not anti-pacifiers from early on either. It's, it's baby to baby. Besides the, um, their pediatrician, what other resources are available for women that might be struggling in that so, first week? Um, there, are, there are our lactation consultants here, and then there's some out in the community. I used um, Brenda Dalton, is that her name? Yeah, Brenda Dalton. Fabulous. Right, she can really help me, so. <laughs> but, um, She's a really good commodity, and a lot of your insurance will pay for it as well. So that, that was very helpful. She has her own little office, and she can sit down with you. I know Vicks will have Jacqueline used her as well for the twins. Um, so there's, there's that. There's, um, I, the lactation consultant showed me these videos that I showed y'all. Um, they're about 10 minutes long each, but I thought these were very helpful. We can share them with our moms if they want to watch a video on how to breastfeed. Um, right there. They're like a global health, so it's not, you know, they're not based in the U.S., but I thought they were very, very helpful. So I think those are support you can use. Yeah, I was looking for Oshkosh baby friendly. Oh, Oshkosh is definitely baby friendly. In fact, they have just uh, a few months ago, they opened the only milk bank in the state of Louisiana. So. Because when we had um, like patient consultant in the clinic, it was enormous help. Yeah. Um, and so if we were to get that again, um, I mean, it really helps our moms whenever they come in and um, yeah. are struggling. 
there's so much going on in those first couple of days after birth with with not only with the baby but with mom too and it's really a lot of times it's not until she gets home and she she's, she feels like she's on her on her own and um and where does where can she get help from and stuff and and unfortunately if they're coming going to a family and friends who have no no background in breastfeeding to help support her then it's really easy to uh give up and go to go to formula and yeah having the lactation consultants up here um Lelechi league in the communities is another resource for a lot of moms in a lot of communities and um and uh, we have had an active little Julie group here. But again, in terms of population, um, uh, a lot of our um, African American clients don't necessarily feel comfortable going to the little Julie groups here, which tend to be more white dominated. Um, so it's, uh, but we do have some peer counselors who come uh, to the floors. Uh, some women who have breastfed uh, their own babies, and they come and talk to the moms while they're still here in the hospital and, and they will uh, follow up with some of them after, after uh, discharge too. And it really is amazing the number of women that are breastfeeding now. I mean, yeah. Because whenever I was a resident, I mean, yeah, it was I mean, it, maybe once zero. a year there was yeah. somebody who breastfed. Right, yeah. Yeah, there's been a remarkable change. In, um, you know, UH started to the process to become a baby friendly hospital and then pulled back, but now they've restarted the process. So it will be whatever the requirements were in the middle of, of that, and, um, it is very likely we'll complete the process to become a baby friendly hospital. So we are completing the process? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah. And for so, medical students who don't know, there's a specific designation. That we're not just talking about being friendly toward <laughs> there's a specific designation that hospitals can get called right. baby friendly and there's yeah. a myriad of things that the hospital has to do right. to yeah. that designation. Yeah. So Very specific requirements. Yeah. Um, From so WHO, a 10 step process, it's very lengthy yeah. and very involved. Yeah. Yeah. So our, and in the well baby visits in the first, the, right after discharge from the nursery and in the first couple months of life, you know, we often for formula fed babies are asking questions about how much formula is like that. What about breastfeeding moms? Are there certain aspects of the well child exam that you could use to help support breastfeeding in moms? Or, I, well generally I, you know, we ask how much uh, formula fed babies getting, but I ask moms how often they're feeding, how long they're feeding. They hear audible swallowing during the entire time that they're feeding, um, and then how many what diapers they're having. I think those are better indicators of how much they're getting. Um, is that what you're asking? Mm -hmm. Okay. Because <laughs> um, I mean, I even thought like I didn't, I wasn't making enough. Like, <laughs> and it was only that I did a lactation um, rotation or lactation elective that I, I learned a lot more. Um, so I thought that was very helpful. But a lot of moms, are, I'm just not making enough. They're so hungry after, after they eat, and so they'll take a bottle. And I was like, "Yeah, babies are greedy. They're gonna eat as much as you give them." So I think it's just a lot of reassurance that they're gonna make enough, unless they have a specific medical reason not to make milk. Um, and a lot of our moms do have, you know, they have a lot of health problems. They could, um, but true milk, true low milk supply is pretty. So that's a really important point that you really can support breastfeeding while you're doing your well child care. And I think that what Laura's done for you is given you a lot of information because the common questions that you're going to hear, she just told you the answers to. So I think it's really important that we incorporate that into our well baby care to make sure that we're addressing those issues so to help make breastfeeding successful and also know what's available in the community, the resources that you could refer a mom to um, if you need to. And then I, so it was a great job, it was a great presentation. So, and then the only other thing I want to mention is that uh, Dr. Bienvenu has been the Louisiana A American Academy of Pediatrics breastfeeding champion for the state for many, many years. Since um, Katrina, and, uh, I guess. and has done a great, yeah. great service to the mothers of the state by, by playing a role in doing that for, for this long. So, so Laura, thank you. It's a great presentation. Thank you.